welcome to the Sage Scholars College Virtuals College Fair. I'm Nicole. I'm going to be your facilitator for this session. There's going to be four uh, total Sage Scholars sponsored sessions. Ooh, say that a few times fast. Uh, this one being the first one of the day. So I do hope that you, you check out the other ones as well. And our colleges will be uh, doing their own live sessions and also having one-to-one -one meetings and, and chatting with students later on uh, today. So please take advantage of, of the opportunities to learn and also to connect with people. I think it's really cool that we're able to do this today. So this panel is all about the college admissions process, which has, I'm sure, changed a bit in the last year, like most of our lives, but also I'm um, sure much of it um, remains the same. And we have some people with some great experiences and we're, I think we're going to learn a lot from them. The first half is going to be uh, them presenting some kind of general information about admissions that they know from their expertise. Uh, and the second half will be all questions. So if you have a question, what we ask you to do within chat, and by the way, you can find chat by going usually to the bottom of your screen if you're on a desktop and hovering over chat. You can type in the word question in all caps and then your question. This way, if there's a lot of conversation going on in chat, we don't miss your question. So again, my name is Nicole and I'll be facilitating today. And this font, this whole fair is sponsored by Sage Scholars, which is a great organization. And I'm gonna just share a little bit of information um, about what Sage does in case you don't already know. And um, we can point you in some directions. So we have some of our staff who are logged in right now. Um, they'll change their name maybe to say Sage so that you know that you can talk to them about Sage Scholars. Um, so basically, uh, Sage Scholars is a membership organization of over 425 private colleges and universities in 46 states. And millions of families, parents, students, grandparents um, have joined together in the common goal of making private education more accessible and affordable. Um, private and public, ed private uh, higher education, whether it is private or public, is really important. But also, it's something that, you know, um, is particularly valuable, we think, with a private higher education because it has unique advantages. We have higher graduation rates, we have fewer years to graduation, smaller class sizes, and better post-college job and graduate school outcomes. Sage Scholars provides a lot of unique opportunities, and since 2018, over 10,000 scholars have applied to our member colleges and matriculated there and received over $260 million in scholarships from those colleges. In addition to the college's award at Sage Scholars um, has made a five-year commitment to providing $1 million in hard dollar scholarships to fund its own students. So if you want some more information about the SAGE program, we, we recommend that you check out the SAGE booth, which is here uh, at the fair. Just go with the, where the colleges are at and you can check out the booth. If you have support specific questions about your particular SAGE account, we recommend that you email support at sagescholars.com. So we're putting both the link to the website and also the link to the uh, email support by starting a support ticket, basically the support staff will be able to pull up your specific information and answer questions about your account. So please check it out. Now today there's a lot of great things going on and it's pretty ambitious. We get that it's a long day in particular over Zoom. So what we ask you to do is take breaks and treat this like you would an in-person college fair. Like maybe you duck out of the room and come back. That's okay. That's exactly what it's for. We want you to both learn things and connect with colleges, and we're incentivizing that by doing a drawing. We're going to have uh, five $100 Amazon gift certificates drawn for the people who participate a lot, which we'll be able to tell from the Visit Days platform. So, um, so please stick around, talk to our colleges, attend, attend some of the sessions. That would be really great. And we have something special for the seniors. If you actually um, seniors will have the opportunity to earn a thousand dollar scholarship if you matriculate to a member college that is participating in this fair. So the Sage crew will have a little bit more information on that than I can get into here. But uh, all in all, we want to incentivize you to stay and really take advantage of the day. So before we begin, I want to introduce Abram, who's kind of in the background. So he is in uh, listed as producer in all caps, and that's just so that he's easy to find. If you're having any kind of technical difficulties during this presentation, um, he's going to be the one who's able to more help you out because I'll be obviously uh, talking with the panelists and stuff here. So please feel free to flag down Abram if you need some help. The main way that we're talking to each other is over chat today. So if you hover kind of over the bottom of your screen, you should see the chat window. 
And again, if you have a question, feel free to type in question and then your question. And that way we're gonna aggregate them off screen and be able to answer them during that portion of things. So without further ado, I wanna introduce our panel. Uh, we've got some three experts and we're gonna kind of spotlight them. I'm gonna introduce all three of them and then we're gonna spotlight them individually and then put them all together for the question portion. So first we have Jen Wing. Uh, she's the Dean of Admissions at the College of Worcester. We have Ashley Poselli, who is the admissions counselor at Immaculata University. And we have Paul Kendall, who's the admissions counselor at DePaul University. So we're gonna start with Jen and see what she has to share with us about her experience in admissions and what admissions is like today. Thank you so much, Jen, for being here. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. And thanks to Sage Scholars for this opportunity to connect with so many great families. And I do wanna just take a moment and say, Thank you for joining us on a Saturday morning. Um, we know that this has been a really challenging year in so many different ways. And um, know that the schools that you're going to be speaking to today, we all understand that you've been under some really incredible um, stress um, as you go through your school experience, but now you're trying to also um, start a college search experience depending on where you are in high school. So please know that we are practicing grace and patience and flexibility through our processes. And I hope that you'll learn a, a lot more about that today through the questions. Um, so my name is Jen Winge and I'm the Dean of Admissions at the College of Worcester. Worcester is a residential liberal arts and sciences college located in Northeast Ohio. We're just about an hour south of Cleveland and about 90 minutes north of uh, the state capital of Columbus. We love our city of 30,000. It actually is recognized as a top 10 micropolitan city uh, for many years. Um, so we're really proud of that entrepreneurial base and economic space that our students can take advantage of. Um, and so it, we usually pleasantly surprise uh, families when they come into Ohio. They may pass a couple cornfields uh, to find Worcester, but once they do, they love the, the hustle and bustle of our city. But most importantly, they are most impressed by our campus uh, we have a beautiful 240-acre campus um, that's located right in um, the, a, a residential neighborhood right from the downtown area. And um, we're most proud of our students. We are intentionally sized at 2,000 students. That's our cap. We don't want to grow. We find that that's an optimal size uh, for students to really understand and learn the liberal arts and, and take on career opportunities um, to launch them into those next steps. Um, but we love that we bring the world to Worcester. We have 46 states and 65 countries at the college. And so we're really proud of the fact that um, we have 17% of our students from international areas around the globe. And so we are the most internationalized campus in Ohio. We have over 99 different programs of study that students can take advantage of. And we're best known for how every student, not just students in honors programs or certain disciplines, but every student, no matter what they study, will take on a long-term research experience in their senior year, which we call the independent study. And we're recognized for that um, globally. Uh, US News has recognized us, paired us with Princeton for the last 20 years for having the best undergraduate experiences. Um, Gallup survey has recognized that saying Worcester is doing exactly what should be happening in the undergraduate experience. And Ron Lieber, um, the New York Times columnist uh, who uh, just has a new best-selling book out called The Price You Pay for College, a great resource for the families on the call today, um, recognized Worcester with its own chapter, the only school with its own chapter for really representing value attributes best. So we're really proud of that too. But we're here today to talk about the new college admissions search. And so I'll just mention, and then I'll turn things over to Ashley, but I'll just mention a few things about you know, what hasn't changed, first of all, is that we want you to stay focused on your academic success. We know things have been different. Some of you have been in hybrid classes and maybe you've been back in class, which is fantastic. But no matter what, we want you to stay focused and stay challenged, right? We want you to take advantage of those opportunities. There will be a place on the common application that allows you to explain what COVID did in terms of um, affecting your, your junior year or sophomore, whatever year it is that you feel like you might have had some change or some challenges based on the pandemic, know that at least for next year for the, the rising seniors in the room, um, the Common App is leaving that question on the application. So we will give you a chance to talk about a little bit about how life was a little bit different. We also know that some things haven't changed. We want you to stay organized and find a 
a system for you and your family to stay organized with the college search. So I always recommend, you know, making sure you have a, a, an email that you, is a go-to um, for, for your college mail, um, making sure that you um, respond to the emails from colleges that interest you so you can demonstrate that interest. Um, so, you know, making sure that you stay organized um, and, and also create a manageable timeline for yourself. Um, I always say that you should recognize that the college search is like an elective in your high school experience. Maybe spend an hour a week on uh, the college search in some way or another, either as a family or as an individual. Um, some things, though, have changed pretty sig significantly. And so that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today, but certainly answer your questions. Um, and so we know that it's been really challenging to visit campuses, although some are starting to really open up. At Worcester, we've actually been open since last May, so it's we've been very fortunate that we've been able to do that safely. Um, but we know not everyone has been able to do that, or your family um, may not be ready to, to travel. Um, but when you are, um, know that there are um, guidelines and, and ways that you can plan accordingly. And I think that Ashley's going to talk a little bit about the campus visits, so I'll leave that for her. Um, and um, but we also know that things have changed pretty dramatically from an online perspective. So we want to make sure that you take advantage of virtual experiences um, as you are today, um, but know that schools are providing some great content um, through live chats and live virtual tours, um, an opportunity maybe to meet with the coach and the team if you're interested in, in playing a sport. So taking advantage of those online um, experiences, you'll find those pretty easily on each website. All right, I'm going to turn things over um, to Ashley. Um, thanks. Awesome. Okay. No, thanks so much. Appreciate your, it's nice to kind of get to know the people as you ask them questions. So, um, so we're going to spotlight now Ashley with Immaculata University. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ashley Polselli. I'm an admissions counselor at Immaculata University located in Malvern, Pennsylvania. Um, so we're right outside of Philadelphia. We're a private Catholic college. Um, you don't have to be Catholic to attend. We do have currently over 1,500 students who attend, and we offer over 60 majors as well as a number of graduate pathways. Um, what I wanted to talk to you guys today was about finding the right fit and making your college decision, as well as some way, things you can consider and ways to do that. Um, so when you're considering which college is the best fit for you, you're thinking about, you know, what's going to be your home for the next four years if you're living on campus or even if you're commuting, as well as, you know, what school is going to prepare you for your future career. So there's a few different aspects that you can consider. Um, one is size. So there's smaller schools, there's larger schools. Some students know where they want to attend, they have an idea that they want to go to a larger school with like a lively, more lively campus. They want to go to a smaller school that, you know, still has a lively campus, but has, um, you know, more personalized connections. No matter which direction you're thinking of going in, I highly recommend visiting both types of campuses because you never know what you're going to like and what you're going to fall in love with. You might have an idea of something in your head that's a good fit for you, but you might fall in love with something completely different. So I always like to encourage students to make sure that you're looking at all different types of schools so you can really start to narrow down your focus and what it is that you're looking for. Um, location is another huge factor. Um, do you want to be in a city? Do you want to be in a more suburban area, rural area? Um, but also what is around campus for you to go to? So, you know, if you need to go to a Target or a CVS, are those accessible to you? Um, where do you and your friends want to go on the weekends or at night if you want to go out to dinner or go someplace to just hang out and have fun? Um, so you want to look at that surrounding area as well and make sure that you're comfortable in your environment. Academics also a huge factor. When you're looking at school, some students have an idea of a major that they definitely want to study. Some are not so sure. So you want to make sure that no matter what school you're looking at, it has what you're interested in. And it also has the resources to help support you through your college journey. So does it have the academic resources to help you if you need a little additional academic support? Does it have the resources to help you with what comes after college and applying for jobs and making you more marketable? Um, if you're not sure what major you're interested in, maybe just have an idea of what you could potentially want to study. Um, if you have a few different ideas, make sure that college that you're going to has those options so that when you decide on what you want to do, um, they have the program to support you. 
Finance is another huge thing to consider. Um, definitely when you're comparing schools, you're going to get your financial aid packages from all different schools. So make sure you lay them out side by side and really look at what's going to be the best financial option for you. Um, you know, when you're looking at scholarships, don't just look at the scholarship um, amount that you're getting, you know, make sure is it a scholarship that's lasting all four years? Is there a time limit on it? Is it going to run out? You want to look beyond just your freshman year and you want to look at the four years as a whole, really see what's the best financial decision for you. Um, and then also, how are you going to, you know, put all of these four factors into consideration? You know, as you start looking at colleges, you know, visiting is a huge help, you know, start making a checklist for yourself, what you like, what you don't like, what you really want to see out of your school. Um, and kind of what Jen was talking on, um, there's all different visit opportunities. I know it's a little difficult right now with, you know, everyone's comfort level and what schools are offering, um, but definitely just start doing your research. Some schools are open, um, Immaculata, we've been open offering on-campus visits as well as virtual visit options to meet the needs of all of our students. Um, but, you know, schools are offering open houses, information sessions, both in person and online. Um, you could do shadow days, you know, sit in on a class, talk to a professor, um, meet with a coach, take a tour, you know, maybe look, um, go to a game if you can, if you're interested in playing athletics. So there's a lot of different visit options, um, whether it's a personalized tour or, you know, a larger group setting um, event that you can go to. So definitely taking advantage of those options, especially now with maybe some of them, you know, opening up more, that'll really help you with narrowing down your decision. Awesome. Thanks so much. <laughs> All right. And we're going to hear now from Paul uh, Kendall from DePaul University. Good morning, everybody. Hi, I'm Paul from DePaul. Very easy to remember. Uh, DePaul University is actually the largest Catholic institution in the U.S. in terms of enrollment. We currently have about 26,000 total students, and we are located in the always exciting and fast-paced city of Chicago, Illinois. Uh, the urban setting of DePaul is something that makes us extremely unique and extremely um, appealing to a lot of students. We actually have two campuses spread throughout the city. There's our Lincoln Park campus located up on the north side of Chicago in the quiet Lincoln Park neighborhood. And then we have our Loop campus located downtown in the central business district of Chicago. And it definitely has something to offer for everybody. In terms of the college admission process and some things that I'd like to touch on today, I really would like to start with the academic profile that high school students are prepping and coming into the admissions process with. Speaking uh, anecdotally, something I can remember from not terribly long ago when I was in your shoes and going through the college search process is that I did feel a lot of pressure to soup up my schedule and basically overexert myself trying to put together this amazing resume of things. I felt like I had to take every AP class and every honors class. I felt like I had to be in every extracurricular activity in every club. I felt like I had to spend every weekend doing hours and hours of community service. And I think many students today uh, do feel a lot of that same pressure that you have to be this superhuman individual who stretches yourself very thin. And I want to uh, really encourage you to fight against that urge, specifically when it comes to the classes that you're taking in high school. Absolutely, as an admissions counselor, I love to see students that are taking AP or honors classes or dual credit classes. I love to see students that are involved extracurricularly and involved in their community. Uh, but what I would not want any students to be doing is putting themselves in a situation of unnecessary stress um, and unnecessary over -anal analyzing of their academic profile. Uh, specifically think about what type of major you might wanna have, what type of career you might wanna have, and then look through the classes that your high school offers and really think about whether or not you think that is necessary. Again, speaking anecdotally, I was always really bad at math. And I knew that I was not going to go on to major in math and I was not going to go on to be an engineer or some career that had math in it. But even still, I was sitting in a senior year AP statistics class, absolutely miserable, getting a D in the class with my GPA taking a major hit because I felt like I have to take every AP class if I want to get into a good school. 
So please, if you're in that situation where you know that something is not your area of interest and you know that something is not the career field you're planning to go to, don't overexert yourself and don't stress yourself out. Take the classes that are necessary. Get the best possible grades that you can get in the classes that are best suited to your abilities. And then come into the admissions process with an absolute confidence and an absolute passion for the things that you have excelled in. And that's going to go a lot farther than simply uh, showing that you've taken every possible class or done every possible activity. Um, and then the next thing I'd like to touch on briefly is just the, um, the ability that you have to network within the campus tours, essentially. Uh, obviously, we have like the in-person tour opportunities that's always been the norm in the past. And I don't think that in-person campus visits can ever be replaced. But I do think that the current uh, culture of the online virtual visits does give you the opportunity to dive a little bit deeper and to really personalize the experience to yourself a little bit better than in-person campus visits have been able to do in the past. Your standard in, uh, on campus in person visit is probably going to show like a handful of like the four or five major areas of campus, the four or five most common buildings. Um, maybe they'll show an academic building or two where a majority of students' majors might fall. Uh, but a lot of times I notice students might come away from an in campus or uh, an in person campus visit feeling like, oh, I really wanted to see this and we didn't get to, or I really wanted to go to this area of campus and we didn't get to. The virtual visits, that's kind of out the window, and they really do allow you to be much more uh, specific and much more personalized. I know that all specifically has this really souped up uh, virtual visit opportunity where you can go in and look at all of the different academic buildings, all of the athletic facilities. Uh, you can go inside all of our housing and peek around at the rooms and what the dorm setup looks like. Uh, and with those virtual visits, definitely take notes of the things that are important to you, your academic building, what uh, dorm you might want to live in, what recreational areas of campus you plan on using, uh, and make sure that you get the opportunity to actually see those things and to see that the school has the amenities that you want it to have uh, and be taking notes about all of those things along the way so that when you're deciding between schools, you really do know definitively that X, Y, and Z colleges uh, were able to show me all of the things I want to see and that they have all of the resources that I want to have. Uh, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop for the time being and pass it back over to Nicole. Thank you, everybody. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to add the other two panelists in here. So we're going to have a sort of Brady Bunch style uh, discussion. And I've got some a couple of questions here as you know, and participants watching, if you have questions about admissions, think of this as your way of getting inside what an admission counselor is thinking without it necessarily having to without necessarily having to ask somebody who uh, is maybe interviewing you to go to a college you want to go to. So um, so my first question is, I'm guessing that this past year has changed a lot for everybody. In particular, though, I'm wondering if there are certain things that have been either more kind of emphasized or more de-emphasized uh, during this whole COVID process. And I don't know, let's start with, and actually, I, I like all your thoughts on this, um, actually, sort of what things, obviously, we can't participate in extracurricular activities as easily, things like that. Um, so what, how has your college sort of admissions process or admissions considerations changed uh, in the past year that maybe might be good for students to know. So let's start with Jen. Yeah, so um, actually before the pandemic, we did decide to go test optional, but I do know a lot of schools have made that decision to at least temporarily for the next year, if not up to three years to be test optional. So at Worcester, that was a, a decision actually based on research that we did with our students that was very appropriate for that. Um, but that has changed the way that we review. I mean, we started to really emphasize more the, um, the, the, the four-year path that students had. You know, I really like to call the transcript at the heart of your application to really understand that four-year journey. And what Paul said, you know, those, those um, appropriate decisions of how to, um, you know, challenge yourself in areas, especially areas that you really love and that you want to, uh, want to pursue. So um, test optional has changed, I think, the process for a lot of schools, and many will probably remain test optional if they hadn't already. So that, that's changing the way I think that you also will approach your, your college search, right? I mean, I, I'm assuming that many um, of your school counselors are going to still encourage you to take the tests, 
because it, it depends on the school, right, that you're, you're applying to, and you may not even know what that list looks like yet. Um, but know that you will have options. You know, there are schools that are test flexible, which means they may not need the SAT or ACT. They might um, choose to ask for AP or uh, IB, International Baccalaureate, or other ways to assess through tests. And most are going to be We're test optional. <laughs> um, most are going to be test optional, which means you have the choice whether to send in an SAT or ACT or not. And there should not be um, any difference with how they're reviewing based on whether you did that or not. So that's, a, I think, a, a, a big portion of what has changed. And, and, and to know that schools are being much more, they're emphasizing other, other um, aspects of your application more. All right, and Ashley, what are your what are you, what is your experience with the with this? Yeah, um, pretty similar to Jen's actually. Um, we've always been test optional for all majors except for um, allied health with the pre pharmacy track and for nursing. Um, but this year we also went test optional for them as well because, um, like Jen was highlighting, we do know that there was a struggle for students to be able to take those SAT scores. Um, and even when they were, sometimes they were only able to take it once. So um, not necessarily an accurate reflection of what they're capable of. Um, so we were definitely looking more at their um, essays, as well as, you know, we usually only require one letter of recommendation, um, but we always encourage them to send in more than one letter. So definitely the more we get to know them um, as an individual and also beyond numbers that we're seeing on an application, um, the better for us, because then we just get to, you know, see another side of them, especially with this year being difficult for students to be able to really participate fully in all their activities and um, community service. Um, like Jen also mentioned earlier on, you know, there is that option on the Common App to kind of explain, you know, um, you know, due to COVID, I wasn't able to do X, Y, and Z. Um, so us just getting to know them um, on another level besides also like their activities resume might not be an accurate reflection of what they were planning to do. Um, so any other way that we can see those activities and what they're interested in is extremely helpful. I have a real quick uh, question that just came up in the, uh, since we are talking about ACTs and being test optional, somebody asked a question, if you're test optional, should they send the test scores in anyways? Um, so DePaul University has been test optional for a few years now as well. Uh, what I would recommend in terms of test optional schools is go onto the school's webpage and look at what the average is. So if a school's average incoming SAT for a freshman, say, is a 22, if you're above that average, then I would recommend submitting. Uh, and I think that that's just kind of a good rule of thumb across the board is uh, for any particular school, if you feel like your scores are at above average, or especially if they're well above average, then it's probably uh, a good choice to submit. And that's, that's just my personal two cents on it. All right. Well, that's a good question. And I'm seeing that we're also getting some general questions about timeline of things. So things like, you know, when should I be applying? You know, how, you know, if I'm planning on going on a college tour in person, like how far ahead should I schedule that? Um, is there resources on either your websites or general resources that you would recommend in terms of students planning kind of when to take tests and, and to do these, these important steps as they consider college? Yeah, I'm happy to I'm gonna plug a little bit of Sage here for you. So the, the Ready Set College website that Sage does host has a wonderful timeline uh, for students um, for their four years at high school of what they can be focusing on. Um, another great site that I really think is helpful, even though I'm not a huge fan of the College Board, I like their bigfuture.com site. I think they do a very nice job of outlining the timeline, uh, providing a great tool for you to, um, uh, you know, talk about characteristics and attributes of the college that are interesting to you and it'll, it'll share some schools that match that and you can compare them. Um, in terms of actually applying for colleges, know that um, really the rule of thumb is um, that you know most college applications for the next cycle are available as of August 1. Some may be a little bit earlier, but really um, the goal is, is that you don't, we don't want you to feel pressure to apply earlier than that. Some flagship institutions are going to ask and encourage you to apply 
um, early, um, late summer or early fall. So keep that in mind. But really, um, our national guidelines, we, um, we, we ask and our best practices are that there's no application deadline earlier than October 1st. So most schools, the majority, ones that are following ethical practices to help and support our families are not requiring a deadline until October 1st. So it's usually around August that you can do that. Now, right now, you can go to commonapp.org um, for the common application, and you can create a profile. Um, and so that could help you at least sort of set the stage and get some of your general biographical information. And it also does allow you to look at the different membership schools since there are over 800 that take the common application. So you can start to do some college search through that too. But again, I wouldn't worry about that. And then in terms of college visits, I think that really is going to depend on your comfort level and when you're ready to travel. Um, like Paul said, there's wonderful virtual tours out there. Um, uvisit.com has many um, schools that are members of that, that you can go just to that site to explore all of the virtual tours, but obviously individual school sites have them too. Um, here at Worcester, we do live virtual tours. So we have two of our tour guides walking you through our virtual tour, but answering questions along the way and having some good banter back and forth. So they're schools are doing a lot of some really interesting things. But really, um, summertime is a great time if you have more flexibility to come visit us. And most schools are starting to open up. Um, but you'll have all of your senior year or if you're um, younger uh, on, this, on this call today, on this event today, really it's your junior year where you're going to feel a little bit more ready to go and visit and have conversations. Right. And I'm just going to point out as um, our university or as our panelists are mentioning resources, we're going to just be putting them in chat. You can download the chat. If you click on the three dots above where you type, there's a save chat option. So if at the end of this, you're like, oh, there's so much useful information. I wish I would have written it all down. Don't worry. You don't have to. You can save the chat. So I'm going to direct this next question at Ashley. Um, and if you don't feel like you're a good person for this, that's fine. But we're, we have a question here, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, the question is, what advice do you have for homeschool students in regards to curriculum? that a college looks for. But I would also maybe extend that idea to maybe somebody is going to a very small school that doesn't have a lot of mm -hmm. kind of uh, classes, class options and things like that, or a lot of extracurricular options. Um, yeah, so, so what are some of the things that somebody in that kind of situation would do to enhance themselves as a, as a good college candidate for your school or any school? Uh, yeah, no, great question. Um, I would say just getting yourself involved in the community. I know sometimes with homeschooling, they do um, do it through a specific school district. So there's like specific guidelines that they might have to follow as far as like um, what classes they need to take. And oftentimes, sometimes those districts will also still allow you to get involved in the school's extra extracurricular activities as well. So keep an eye out for those options. Um, but if you know, if you're interested in athletics, maybe join a club team, um, you know, doing community service in your community, um, starting some kind of community service for yourself. I saw a student this year um, on her application, she wrote that, you know, because of COVID and the limited time that she had to do her school's extracurricular activities, she started using her extra time to make masks for her community and for a, um, nursing home actually near her house, which I thought was pretty cool. And that really also stood out um, on her application when I was reading it. So, um, you know, there's definitely a lot out there. Um, you know, maybe if there's a, a play um, in your uh, community, get involved in that too. Um, you know, there might be some tutoring opportunities that come up as well. So, you know, definitely just looking and seeing what you can still get involved in um, through those aspects. I don't know if Paul and Jen can add any more information to that, um, but yeah, that would be my biggest piece of advice. Yeah, I don't really have a ton else to add to that. I think that pretty much is a good like encompass of it. Um, in general, certainly at DePaul and probably at most institutions, given the current circumstances, we are going to be as understanding as possible. Just indicate the activities or the, the interests that you have, the things that you would be doing if not for the restrictions or your own comfort level. Um, and and I, I really don't think that anyone should feel like they're going to be penalized for not having been able to be involved in things. Of course, we, we totally understand uh, this has been a really, really tough time for 
high school students, particularly those that are graduating um, and not having the opportunity to do all of those things that we know you want to do is something that I, I actually feel somewhat badly about. And certainly uh, no one's gonna be penalized for that. So uh, please just indicate your interests and let us know that you know if I could, I would be doing this. All right, thanks you guys. Great. Um, we're getting some really great questions in now um, the chat, so I'm just catching up on them. Um, somebody was asking, and I think this is kind of a good question, right? They do a lot of different things in terms of leadership positions, extracurricular activities, and things like that. If they are applying to a college, how do you feel about seeing everything versus seeing highlighted things? Um, and I'll let you kind of all weigh in on that maybe rapid fire-ish because I don't know, maybe there's a different, different views on this. Yeah, I'm happy to just kick off on that one. So we understand that there are students out there that love to do many, many things and can multitask well, and that's how they thrive, right? And so absolutely, if they're, you know, if you want to share how you spend your time, you can add that to the common application. There's plenty of space to do that. Make sure you share, you know, any um, involvement or ways that you've contributed in different ways. So th those students, you know, they exist out there and it's great and they do really well at Worcester. We also understand, and I think Paul, you know, highlighted this in his initial thought, you know, converse, or comments is that we know that um, not everyone can do that. They may have a part-time job, which you should list. They may need to take care of family members at home which you should list as an activity. I mean, how do you spend your time? How are you growing? How are you contributing either to your family, um, your school, your church, others in your neighborhood? Um, so I think it's fine to list all of those, but you know, it, it is helpful to list um, you know, what you're most interested in or how you spend your most time or you know, where you can maybe um, share a little bit more of a story through your essay or through the interview. Um, you might want to do more of a hierarchical order in terms of the amount of time and commitment for each. But again, we don't expect that of everyone. I would much rather see one, two, three activities where you can actually share a story about how you um, contributed or um, engaged um, with friends and peers or gave back in some way and, and did some service learning projects. So know that we would much rather have breadth and depth to your experience than just a laundry list of activities. Yeah, I agree with Jen. Um, I would also say sometimes it could depend on what your goal is as well. If you're specifically targeting maybe a specific scholarship, for example, if it's like a community service based scholarship, um, then, you know, you definitely want to highlight and make sure you're saying everything you're doing in community service, because sometimes the more hours that are shown, the more um, you might be considered for a specific scholarship because sometimes they are based on a certain amount of hours and specifically what you've done in those hours. So I also think it can sometimes depend on what specifically your goal is. Um, but I always feel the more that you share can share, the better. Uh, personally, I would say absolutely like leadership positions should be at the top and highlighted first if you've ever held leadership positions. Um, outside of that, I would mostly recommend staying focused on the things that you were involved with for the longest amount of time. So if you were in three different things all four years of high school, and then you were in like six different things for like one year or two years, I probably wouldn't put as much focus on trying to show me that you did five different clubs, like only your freshman year and then not again after that. I would absolutely keep it focused around leadership positions and things that had longevity. Um, most of the time, if you were in something for four years, you know that that's the thing you really liked and that's the thing that you can talk about. And most of the time, you probably know that if you were in the something for just one year and then you dropped out of it, that it probably wasn't that important to you and it's not really worth diving into. All right, and we have a few questions that I'm gonna sort of aggregate together in an idea. I don't know if they actually go together, but I'm, we're gonna try this out. So somebody was asking about, for example, if there's an optional part uh, of the application, like an essay, you know, if they should be filling that out. 
And, you know, someone in the chat just asked about like kind of your selection process, but I think this question might sort of encompass everything, which is for like, what is some, what is, what is it that you look for in a potential student that shows that that student's serious about, about your school? Um, what makes them stand out and you say, this person definitely wants to come to my school and I'm going to try to make that happen. So let's start and let's go in reverse order. Let's start with Paul. So I'll highlight a couple different things. Number one, just general overall engagement with the materials and the communications that are being sent to you. Like when I go into my like database and I can go into a student's profile, I can look and see, you know, any email that they were ever sent, any text message that they were ever sent, any like uh, invitations to visit campus or materials that were sent to them. And if I look and see that, you know, you've opened and then not responded to 35 different emails over the last six months, that probably is going to indicate to me that you're not very invested in DePaul or that this is not where you want to come to school. Uh, so if you really are interested in a school and you know that you're planning to apply or you know that you're thinking about attend, make sure that at least on a semi-regular basis, you are responding to something or emailing us on your own or just somehow like making contact with your admission counselor or with someone in the school. Uh, that's definitely, you know, the, the biggest way to show us that you're interested. Uh, but it, in general, kind of bouncing off of this last comment that I can see about like selecting or deselecting, um, I would push away from the idea that we never deselect students because sometimes a particular school maybe just isn't right for you right now, but that doesn't mean never. Like the number of students that can transfer at DePaul and many schools, like you're pretty much always a potential student and your academic path can always change. So I'm really never like writing any students off. I'm just kind of assessing how much interest there is at this moment and how good of a fit they are for my school at this moment. Um, I would say like your level of engagement. So definitely like the amount of times you're visiting campus. If you're visiting multiple times and going to different kinds of events, um, then I'm taking that as, oh, you're very interested in seriously considering Immaculata. Um, also your open communication as well. Like um, how many times are you reaching out to me? Are you, are you asking me questions? Are you asking about your financial aid package? Um, are you taking an extra step to you know, learn more information about Immaculata. You know, are you asking, can I speak with a professor? Can I speak with a student? Can I have more information about this specific program? The more questions that you ask me about Immaculata and the more in depth that you're trying to learn the information about the school, the more that I'm gonna know you're interested. Yeah, and I'll, I'll tackle the question about optional essays. You know, I, 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 I've been on a lot of panels. I've been doing this for 25 years and I've been with schools um, that are like Worcester that you know, have admit rates of 50% or higher and schools that have admit rates of 30% or below. And I think every school, if they are providing the option to share more information and it's part of their application saying, this is an optional additional essay or answer this question about why Worcester you really should, if you're that interested and invested in, in that school, I would take the option to complete it because sometimes that demonstrated interest is what makes a difference when they're receiving so many thousands of applications that they're seeing a student is taking that extra step. So whenever you have a chance to showcase yourself in that way and invest in that the, the time into that school, I would do it, um, especially for the highly selective schools, um, yes take advantage of the additional essay that they may be saying is optional. Um, at Worcester, we do have a, a short answer essay on our Common App, and it's a simple one, but um, we it, it's, it's why Worcester? Why are you applying? And it does help us <laughs> weed out uh, out of 6,600 applications for 550 spots, you know, is a student serious about applying or were they just checking us off as another school on the Common App? So take, take advantage of sharing a little bit more about why. Um, and you can do that not just through a, a short answer essay, but you know, as Ashley and Paul have said, there are other ways to demonstrate that interest. Um, 
You may not be able to visit right away, but you can attend a virtual event and ask a few questions. You can find out who your admissions counselor is who's responsible for your neck of the woods and reach out and introduce yourself. And God forbid you pick up the phone and actually call us and have a question. Know that that stands out, um, that you're taking that time. So being able to, um, yeah, being able to stand out that way is, is important, I know. Um, but we don't also want to stress you out. We know that there are logical times to do that. Um, I can always tell when a junior or even a sophomore in their junior year is being forced by their parents to come to campus and interview. Don't, you know, make sure that you're ready for that step. Um, make sure that you're excited about that step. Um, we don't want you rolling your eyes in an interview or falling asleep in an info session. Those things happen. <laughs> so we want to make sure that it, you're ready and you're excited about that next step. Wow, that sounds really painful. Um, yeah, so we have a series of questions about um, kind of standardized tests. Honestly, I think the amount of questions we have and how specific they are points to a need, I think, for us to have a session, maybe at our next virtual fair, a little bit more about standardized tests. So those of you who've asked questions about that, um, stay on our email list and we'll also let you know. I, I really think we need to be able to dive into that. So I'm not skipping those because I want to. I'm just skipping those because I think um, that is something that we might need some more time to really address. But there are a couple of questions that I think we could address now before we adjourn. Um, so the first one is, you know, what um, about deciding on a major? Because it sounds like it sounds like a lot of um, kind of picking of colleges is thinking about what you want to study, and you know, but also you know you have a lot of different programs and potential programs. So um, is helping students uh, decide on a major something you feel like? Uh, that you help do maybe through the admissions process or something that happens once they get to the university? And if someone was trying to think about what major they might want or what field they might want to study, what's uh, what are some resources or or some ideas that you could get uh, give them to help them get there? Um, I'll start with Ashley and then we'll go uh, with Paul and then Jen. Um, so I would say both. We definitely help them decide on um, a, a major they could potentially want to study, but then also once they start at Immaculata will help them as well. So on the admission side, when I'm meeting with students, if they don't really have an idea or they're kind of like toying between two different ideas, um, I like to ask them questions like, what are your hobbies or what are your interests? Or like, what's one class in high school that you took that you really loved? Um, and then depending on what they say, kind of turn that into a major. So like, for example, if a student's like, oh my gosh, I love music. I play three different instruments, but don't really know what to do with that career wise. Um, I'll be like, okay, well, there's music therapy, there's music education, there's music performance, and then we'll kind of start to go down that line. Um, on the academic side, like after they already start at Immaculata, we have our career and professional development office as well as our academic success office that will work with the students to sit down with them um, and explore different majors and career paths. What can you do with this major? Um, how many years of schooling is it going to take you to get there? Um, are you going to have to do an internship? Um, there's personality tests that they can take as well, um, which can help narrow down the focus and say, okay, based off of your results, here's a list of possible careers that could be a really good fit for you that you might end up loving. Um, so it's kind of a team effort. Um, and if you're kind of, you know, thinking about a major, but not really sure about it, um, ask us for more information on the specific major. You know, we have a bunch of like flyers we can send. Um, we can have you shadow a class so you can specifically sit in on a class and see, um, what it's like in that major. You could speak with the professor. You can speak with current students in the major to learn what they're doing and what internships they're doing and what their goals are. Um, so there's a lot of different opportunities to really get a feel for, you know, even, you know, once COVID and it starts to be safer, if you can shadow a specific um, career, like in the actual office, like I encourage you doing that as well to really see what goes on behind the scenes and something you're considering. Yeah, and somebody yeah, kind of clarified, which is if someone comes in as an undecided major, does that make you think less of them as an admissions candidate? No, mm -mm. Okay. nope. Awesome. I think, you know, there's nothing wrong with being undecided. It's really hard to really know what you want to do in high school. Even when you're in college, it's difficult to figure out what you want to do. So, you know, we have the undecided program specifically designed to help our students figure out what it is they want to study, which goes into the career development office and the academic success office that I was talking about, they're going to really help you narrow down what's going to be a good fit for you. 
Undecided is the most common major amongst freshmen at DePaul. So it definitely does not make anyone think less of you. It's the norm, in fact. Uh, something you will find about not just college, but your life in general is most people don't really know what they want to do. And most people float around and try out different careers and kind of learn by experience. And you as a student will do the same in your major. So there's definitely nothing weird or wrong about undecided or about not knowing. I pretty much assume that students don't know unless they tell me definitively that they do. Um, broadly speaking, I would also just kind of like to reiterate an emphasis on career preparation, uh, something that never really sunk in with me until after I was well beyond my college experience is that college is intended to prepare you for a career. It is not intended to just be an extension of high school. And I very much did treat college like an extension of high school because I was like, oh, well, um, I was always good in English and got A's in my English classes, so I'll be an English major. And that's what I did. Um, and then later on, I kind of realized like, oh, well, you know, of course, there's nothing wrong with majoring in English if that's what you really want to do. But that is not the reason I made that decision. I kind of just thought like, oh, college is more school. So I'm going to pick the subject that I'm good at. So I'm definitely going to encourage people against that and really do think about career preparation and where you see yourself maybe 10 years from now, what sort of job you wanna have, and then thinking about the steps you might have to take to get that job. Additionally, that is what academic advisors are for, and that is what career counselors are for. Majority of schools will have plenty of resources available, DePaul included, uh, academic advisors to help you choose your classes and choose what you need for your major, as well as career counselors to help you weed out what your strengths are, uh, teach you how to interview and how to build a resume and cover letter and really prepare you for, for going out. And work. I think you guys did a great job. I'll just mention quickly that it, I know this is hard, but it, it depends, I think also like at a school like Worcester, we're a liberal arts and sciences education school. We would much rather have people come in undecided and, and like um, DePaul, we see mostly that um, people can let us know what they're interested in, and um, but they don't have to declare a major till the end of their sophomore year at Worcester. And we have a core curriculum and advising model and a career center that helps students explore exactly what um, others have been talking about. So know that the majority of liberal arts colleges would rather you have an, more of an open mind. But there are some schools out there that want to know. And it, does, it is important to say what you're interested in. So like Carnegie Mellon, for instance, they want to know exactly what program um, that you're interested in because they will have very specific requirements for, for that particular major and program. So I do think it's an important question to ask as you develop your list and start your application process to ask each individual office. Okay, and I'm just gonna end on a quick, like if you could answer this in one sentence, what would it be? Which is, and someone just asked, um, how do you look at somebody who goes to maybe a community college for the first two years and then transfers to one of your institutions? So I get that answering that in one sentence might be hard, but just like a hard no or a depends or a something would be great. Jen, we'll start with you and Ashley and then Paul. We are very, um, we welcome with open arms the transfer experience for the students that are at community colleges. We know that they've made that decision for a variety of reasons. Um, and we just want to make sure that they are, um, you know, they've, they've chosen course curriculum that is going to help them thrive and transition well here. Um, so know that um, most institutions, and especially now with COVID and how, you know, students are making some really uh, um, interesting decisions about gap years and community college and dual credit, know that um, many schools are very flexible about that and we would welcome that. Yeah, um, we also love transfer students and welcome them with open arms. We want to make sure that we're getting you in your intended major that you're interested in. And we are also making sure that we are getting as many credits as you completed transfer over as possible, um, whether it's counting as a specific major credit or maybe as an open elective credit. We want to make sure that you're getting credit for all of your hard work um, and then continuing your success at Immaculata. 
transfer students are great and they are an integral part of DePaul University as well. Don't have anything bad to say about any decisions you might make to come to the school of your choice later down the road, whether that's financial reasons, academic reasons, maybe you want to be closer to home for a little while, or even sometimes, you know, sometimes students don't always get into their first choice school on the first try, but that doesn't mean that the journey has to be over. You can always reapply as a transfer or uh, you know try something different for a little while and then move back towards DePaul or another school. Uh, so definitely don't ever feel like your journey with any one institution is over after you graduate high school. Um, you know you can always circle back. Awesome. Well, I just want to thank all of our panelists for their great information. Um, if you want, like I said, you can download the chat. There's a list of resources there. We're also recording the session, which uh, Sage Scholars will be posting. Um, so, you know, keep a lookout for that recording. Uh, thank you so much also for the participants for attending and asking great questions. And um, the next session, if you're interested in continuing to attend our info sessions, starts at uh, 1110 uh, Eastern Standard Time and it's gonna be about financial aid. So we're gonna take a little brief break here. Thank you all so much, Jen and Ashley and Paul, and uh, we'll see you guys in the next session.